Ancient Hindus were knowledgeable about sexuality and wrote many treatises on the subject. Their temples were often decorated with bas reliefs that can now be interpreted as erotic. They developed esoteric teachings that linked spiritual development with sex, and their temple attendants eventually became prostitutes. Why this happened, and why the author of the Kama Sutra advised his student to drown himself in a river, is the subject of our new video in our series about the history of sex. The inhabitants of the Indian Peninsula, known for their ancient culture, recognized the need for sexual education quite early. Thus, in the 4th-6th century AD, the philosopher Vatsyayana Malanaga who lived in the Gupta Empire, wrote the well-known treatise, Kama Sutra, dedicated to the sensual aspects of life, more fully called, Vatsyayana's Kama Sutra, instruction on Kama, belonging to Vatsyayana. Kama, in ancient India is the sensual side of life, which includes love between the sexes and passion and sexuality in all its manifestations. In fact, according to legend, a conversation took place between the philosopher and his disciple that led the scholar to write his famous work. One day a young adept, seized by lust, approached Vatsyayana for advice. Vatsyayana first suggested a religious marriage and many children to channel his desires. As the discussion heated up, the sage suggested limiting intimacy to once a year, but this was not enough for the adept. In response, Vatsyayana suggested a monthly compromise, but warned the adept of the consequences, but even this was not enough for the young disciple. Finally, the dialogue ended with the sage's radical advice to go and drown himself in the holy river to purify himself and find a new existence, symbolizing the renunciation of animal desires. Having provoked the wrath of the sage, the disciple encouraged the teacher to do a good deed and the latter wrote a treatise on the sensual side of existence. However, it is more devoted to the social aspects of an ancient Hindu's life his ability to communicate with his wife and mother-in-law. And only the fifth part of the book is devoted to the sensual aspects themselves, where among other things, 64 positions for sex are described. Judging from the customs we read about in the Kama Sutra, Indian society at that time had a rather loose attitude towards sex. Some chapters describe a love triangle situation where the husband's mistress is present along with the wife and husband. But the wife, characteristically, also has all kinds of rights in Vatsyayana's work. Here's what history professor Anne Hardgrove writes in her book Community and Public Culture, The Marwaris in Calcutta, 1897-1997. What is particularly unique about the Kama Sutra is its emphasis on creating pleasure for the woman. A man who is unable to provide and fulfill these pleasures may lose a woman's favor, and she may seek pleasure elsewhere where she can find it. Vatsyayana also had followers in later times. In the 12th century, for example, a scholar named Kakoka wrote the Ritirahasya, also known as the Koka Shastra, another sex manual divided into 15 parts describing types of female character and temperament, as well as various sexual techniques. Even later, in the 15th and 16th centuries, a Brahmin named Kalyan Mala wrote a work called Ananga Ranga, or Stage of Love. In this treatise, advice is given in verse form to a man on how to achieve pleasure with his wife. Sexual positions are also listed. The ancient Indians, of course, did not limit themselves to treatises on sex. They created an entire esoteric doctrine, now called Tantra. It is based on the understanding that the world is divided into two origins, static and active, male and female. According to its followers, the connection and interaction of these origins, if properly harnessed, can develop human spirituality. In fact, tantric teachings provide ways and skills to reach high spiritual levels, including through sexual practices. Here are the words of Dr. Judith Orloff from her article, Conscious Sex, Surrendering to the Bliss of Sexual Energy as a Path to Healing and Growth, 
Tantra is a potent Hindu system that teaches the art of erotic love by combining sex and spirit. Westerners often see sex as linear, the goal being orgasm, but Tantra views sexual love as a sacrament and an energy exchange between two people. According to Tantra, orgasm isn't simply a physical release. Using specific positions, you move erotic energy upward from the private parts to nourish and purify your whole being. In other words, by sublimating sexual energy, Hindus sought to achieve enlightenment. In any case, as far as the author understands this teaching, that was its original purpose. Ancient Indians did not only study sex from books or achieve orgasm and try to attain enlightenment through it. They were also no strangers to depicting images on the bas-reliefs of their temples, which our contemporaries find absolutely unacceptable. In some of them, the bas-reliefs can be recognized as purely erotic, such as the Sathyamorthi Purumal Temple, the Ranakpur Jain Temple, and the Virapaksha Temple. They depict only naked girls and boys with perfectly distinguishable sexual characteristics. In other temples, the ancient architects did not embarrass themselves in any way. For example, in the Lingaraja temple, built in the 11th century, there are bas-reliefs of couples standing embracing and kissing, and the male organ of the man is highlighted. Some images can even be interpreted as sex. But why interpret anything when there is a sun temple of Madhara where bas-reliefs depict natural orgies? In some of them, two men are having intercourse with one girl, and in others, one man is having intercourse with several women. The pearl of such temple construction can be called Kajuraho, where in the period 10th-11th centuries were created 85 temples, 20 of which have survived to our days. And not for nothing. On the outer walls of temples in Kajuraho, you can see all the variety of sexual life of ancient Indians. There are classics, orgies and scenes of oral sex. There are even images of men having sex with a horse and what can be interpreted as a woman having sex with an elephant, or a god with an elephant's head. Of course, these images were not pornography in the modern sense. It should be understood that sensuality was part of the life of ancient Hindus, and they quietly depicted sexual scenes on the walls of temples, thus demonstrating the life not only of humans, but also of celestials and various spirits. As scholars Kaustav Chakraborty and Rajarshi Guha Thakarada write in Indian Concepts on Sexuality, nudity in art was considered acceptable in southern India, as evidenced by paintings at Ajanta and sculptures of the period. It is likely that, as in most countries with tropical climates, Indians from some regions were not required to wear clothing and, except for fashion, there was no practical need to cover the upper half of the body. The 10th and 12th centuries saw the creation of some of India's most famous ancient art, which often loosely depicted romantic themes and situations. Examples include the depiction of asparas, roughly equivalent to nymphs or sirens in European and Arabic mythology, on some ancient temples. The best and most famous example of this is the Kajuraho complex in central India. But not only pictures delighted the eyes of ancient Hindus, in the temples you could see temple dancers. In the video about ancient Mesopotamia, we mentioned the temple priestesses of love who were given to pilgrims for generous offerings. There was such a tradition in ancient India as well. Historian Shingle Anchor, in his article, The Devadasi System, Temple Prostitution in India, writes. The historical account of the Devadasi system is vague because of its early origins. The first confirmed mention of Devadasi was during the Kashari dynasty in the 9th century AD in eastern India. The practice began when one of the great queens of the dynasty decided that in order to honor the gods, some women trained in classical dance should marry deities. At first, everything looked decent. Young girls devoted themselves to one of the temples, lived there, performed ritual acts, waving statues of the gods, dancing and singing at celebrations and processions in the city. They could easily marry and inherit property, and they were quite privileged representatives of their class. Gradually, 
However, the situation changed, and if at first the girls began to please the temple attendants, later they were sold to wealthy Hindus. As researcher Maria Costanza Tori writes in her publication, Abuse of Lower Castes in South India, the Institution of Devadasi. Contrary to the impression often given, there is absolutely no evidence that girls dancing in temples were prostitutes, sacred or secular, between the 6th and 10th centuries AD. The association of Devadasi with prostitution seems to have emerged after the 10th century. The rise and fall of Devadasi status paralleled the destruction of temples by invaders, which began at the northwestern frontiers and spread throughout the country. After this change in status, Devadasis became something akin to elite love priestesses stationed at local temples, who in addition to entertaining customers, danced, sang, and assisted the local priests in worship. Parents often gave girls to the temple, hoping that such a sacrifice would give them the opportunity to have a son. At the age of seven or eight, the girl underwent a rite of passage and was married to a local god. At the time of the marriage, the image of the god was usually replaced by a sword or disc, which the girl held in her hands while the priest read the necessary passages from sacred texts. Over time, devadasis virtually lost their special status and became common prostitutes. This process was particularly rapid during the British conquest of India. However, even in the 20th century, the Indian government actively fought temple prostitution. But the custom became so deeply ingrained in the culture that it persists to this day. In addition to the Devadasi, there were of course ordinary prostitutes and analogues of the Greek heteras, here they were called Ganikas. They were also trained in many arts, could hold conversations on various subjects, were excellent singers and dancers, and were free to choose a patron. An important part of a Ganika's training was to master the 64 poses described by Vatsyayana in the Kama Sutra, so that the lover of such a girl could receive all kinds of sensual pleasure if he was not afraid of breaking his spine by twisting in some particularly tricky positions.